One of the big reasons for the beginning of the Cold War, it's not working. Oh. All right, now it's working. Is it a lot nicer? <laughs> We're showing the class. Everybody, look busy. <laughs> Actually, that's kind of an improvement. But <laughs> all right. So the thing about the Cold War is, so much of it had to do with, with fears and total misunderstanding of each other. They just frankly did not know about the other group, the other side. Partially is because, you know, the Soviet Union was a police state and information didn't get out. But also, just total misconceptions. And this is going to lead to fear. Everybody's going to think the worst. And it's really going to be a shock to the people. The assumption was the U.S. and the Soviet Union will be friends after the war. The West and East, West and East will come together. And then it seemed to blow up in everybody's face. And part of the reason why the Cold War got so scary it's because people's minds were still in total war. And that's something you have to get. They haven't left that idea of total war. The fear drummed up by total war. The hatred. And so it's still there. Just as for the same reason there was a red scare after World War I. There's going to be a red scare after World War II. It's just the people are still on edge. It's one of those things that maybe things could have been different if somehow they could have avoided these misunderstandings. Yeah, possibly, but that's a what if that we'll never know. But the thing is, there were fears, and there were some legitimate fears. We're going to go through these very, very quickly. Fears that both sides have. Reasons they thought they could not trust and think the worst of the other side. And so, we got U.S. and we got Soviet. That, that's Soviet, obviously, correct? West, East, blue, red. Good evil. The evil empire. All right. Number one. The U.S. fear, big one was, is they feared communism. The U.S. had always had that. Remember the bomb throwing anarchists? That had been around for a very long time. A fear and not really understanding what it was. There's two interesting things about that. First off, Many of the moderate socialist prescriptions were part of the New Deal and the Progressive Era. People loved them. They loved them. Still do. But they just didn't know that they were kind of socialist. But the other thing is this. Communism represented somebody who's going to take away, take away what you earned. Somehow take it away from somebody you earned and give it to whom? Actually, not just everybody, because you're, 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 if I'm taking away from you, I'm not going to give it back to people anymore. People who didn't deserve it. People who didn't earn it. To people who don't deserve it. Now, that's really not what it is. It's much more complex than that. But you have to think it in terms of the psyche of the American public. We just had the Great Depression. Years of want and fear. And then the World War II. Same deal. But the U.S. came out of the war economically stronger than ever. People had more money than ever before. They're soon going to call it the affluent society. And they're thinking, we earned this. Now we can finally enjoy it, our life. And here are the commies coming to take it away. Yeah, I'm looking at all of you. Right? Because I give and give and give to you. And what do I get in return? Actually, that's true. 
We do have a little socialist little experiment to help all you urchins out. Do you know what it is? Uh, education is part of it, yeah. Yeah, no, pinkos. You should work for your education. Punk. Child labor. Child labor. We sub yeah, through taxes, we subsidize you. I subsidize you. I'm tired of it. I pay more in taxes than your parents do. That's garbage. That's actually true. You guys are a big tax write off. Not anymore, because we're at one of those 17. Hmm? One of those 17. And you still write them off if you're dependent. No, because my face is trying to stop the stuff. And you still write them off. Yeah. yeah. Two! Yeah. You have to go through it. There's lots of shit. Number two. That's communism. I'm tired of it. I bet your parents are spending on things like food. Another, I'm going to go look at it and see what they're spending. You with me? Okay, number two. The children's? Ah. Have you ever seen little kids? They're like this tall. They just stand. Yeah, they come at you. They're scary. Like zombies. Number two. World War One. The United States has not forgiven the Soviet Union for getting out of World War One. The Treaty of Brest the you know, These these old these things they remember. You can't trust these people. They left us on the lurch, and Germany almost defeated us. Russia was beaten. I mean, don't think of reality. These are ideologies. This is an ideology. Three, the purges. And the terror, or Stalin forced collectivization of farms and industry, leading to a famine that killed millions, millions of slave laborers died, forced industrialization of the Soviet Union, its purges and terror. And in the 1930s, Stalin, the most paranoid man ever to live, got rid of every potential enemy. Every Bolshevik, almost every Bolshevik, that was still alive in the 1930s, that was a part of the revolution, would die an unnatural death because of Stalin. So he got rid of everybody. And so he is truly a horrible dictator. The fear, there's an element of truth. Yeah. But Barry, he's head of the NKVD. Right? He's, he's, he's uh, head of the NKVD all through World War II, all the way up to 1954. Be executed. And you know what? A lot of people they killed in the purges with these old, his communist cronies he didn't trust anymore. They were really horrible people. So it's not like everyone's innocent in this. Four, Hitler Stalin Pact. He made a deal with the devil. Can we trust him? Of course, you can make the argument. So did the US and Britain. They made a deal with the devil, and his name was Stalin. You see the problem with all this talk? We say how evil he is, yet we allied with him and send him billions of dollars for the stuff. There's a lot of inconsistencies here. And number five, Eastern Europe. Especially Poland. Something you, you had to mention something about this in your, or that's one of the things that's really important to put down for your essay, because this was the justification for fearing the communists. They did that in Eastern they promised free election, didn't do it. And the United States looked at it as, the West looked at it, is they were taking over these areas and making them dictator or dictatorships, they call them satellite states. They did it because it's part of a Soviet plan to take over Europe. And that's the important thing to understand. This is just step one to take all Europe. Don't think so much of the world, think Europe. Yes. At this time, like, who is even the next? Was Russia the biggest country at this time? What they? The, yeah, they were the biggest country. These were American fears. Now, a lot of them didn't really understand. Uh, a lot of them were problematic, and there's some reality in here. Now, the Soviet fears. The Soviet fears really basic. They hate us. 
They've always been against us. They've always wanted us gone. May Day, May 1st, which is going to be the day, this, um, this International Labor Day, would be the day that the Soviets would have the biggest grand march in, in Moscow, May 1st. This huge celebration of communism and the workers' paradise of the Soviet Union. Where'd that come from? May 1st. Why is that celebrated? Was it that? Labor Day? It would. That's what the U.S. wanted. Uh, workers wanted, but they do it in September. Chicago, 1887. Protest for an hour work day. Do you remember that? Haymarket Affair. Do you remember that now? Does that ring a bell? Haymarket Affair. May 1st happened here. And so the Soviets could say, see, they hate workers. They hate you. They hate you. And then you're right about that. They hate us, meaning they hate the Soviets, not the U.S. They were also here They're they're getting off it, yes. And including in that is the Allied invasion, as Taylor said. The when the U.S. sent troops in the Russian Civil War, the Allied intervention. When the U.S. sent troops along with the British and the French and the Japanese and the Italians, here, here, and here. Number two, Versailles. Russia was not allowed at Versailles. They hadn't forgotten that. I know they're in the Civil War. They left the war. But they don't care. We weren't allowed to, like this peace was dictated upon us and we had to live with it and that's what led to Hitler. Number three, Munich. They weren't allowed to the Munich Agreement. Munich is the one uh, where Britain, especially with Britain and France, allowed Germany to take the Sudetenland, and they would eventually take all of Czechoslovakia. That was the best example of appeasement. And Stalin was furious about this, and that was, and to Stalin, that's why he felt he had no choice but to unify with Hitler for a while, because Britain and France kept him out of this, the West, generically. Almost forgot to say one thing here for number five. Make sure you get down somewhere about Yalta. That Yalta agreement, they tricked us, they lied to us, they tricked poor FDR. In fact, that's where you're going to get a lot of people calling Yalta just like Munich. Just like Munich, appeasement. I heard a guy, well, I didn't actually, I was not watching, but I read about a guy who said that on the news the other day talking about uh, the Iran agreement again. And I just thought that was hilarious because he knew nothing what happened in Yalta or one Munich. He must have read it in an email, his talking point. Say Yalta and Munich. Yalta and Munich! And the assumption is nobody knows what he's talking about. Four! The delay in the second front. D Day was until 1944. And yes, the Americans and the British and the French, the Canadians, when they did attack here, a lot of German forces would be committed. It was a second front, but to the Soviets' point of view, Millions died before you ever did that. They're still, still upset about that. Five, the whole issue about reparations and lend lease. They were promised reparations, didn't get it. They were promised lend lease. Now, lend lease was a little more complex. There was a convoy of nearly 50 US ships in May of 1945, going around Norway on the way to Murmansk with lend lease supplies. It was just, a, well, it was way over the Arctic Circle, just about around Norway, when the VE Day happened. And somebody ordered that convoy, to this day we're not sure, it came from the State Department, ordered that convoy to turn around and not deliver the aid. Now, it only went back south for a day and then turned around and did deliver the aid. But of course, Stalin heard about it. And to Stalin, that proved every one of his fears. I knew it. They were just trying to kill us, and that's why the delay here. They wanted to kill us off and use Soviet blood to defeat Germany. That proves it. Told you so, kind of thing. And there is a number six. The United States and the West, but especially the US, never understood the Soviet 
fear of Germany. They feared Germany. And so when the Allies said no reparations, that confirmed their biggest fear. Stalin believed, completely believed this, that the Western Allies were going to rearm Germany and send them back again. Why believed they, it. Why did they fear? Yeah, World War One and World War Two. So that's why. And they lost World War One and World War Two. They almost did. And that's why he felt he had to have this buffer zone. Had to have it. And so this gets back to the whole core of the misunderstanding from the very moment of Yalta on. To the out to the West point of view, this was part of a Soviet invasion. By conquering this land here, that means we're going to try to get the rest of Europe. That's what the West thought. Eastern Europe was just a stepping stone to get Germany, get all of Germany, France, England, and then what? Wyoming, right? Boom, 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 boom to Wyoming. In fact, you better write this down. All roads lead to Casper, <laughs> right? We've been to Casper. Cool, cool. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Have you been to Bill? Bill Wyoming? I don't think I've lived. All right, so that's what they believe. Now, not saying that Stalin wouldn't have taken whatever line he could get, and certainly not justifying what Stalin did, but when he created satellite states here, it was defensive. To Stalin's point of view, it's defensive because he feared Germany so much. It's defensive. Now, looking back at it, it's the wrong thing to do. It's hor horrific what's going to happen in these countries, especially Hungary. What's going to happen there? But the important thing to understand is here, and this one you might want to put up a little asterisk or something around there. This is why it is very important to understand your potential adversary's motivation. You got to know what they're thinking. You don't have to agree, but you got to know. Why did they do these things? Now, that doesn't mean you say, okay, now that I know, I agree. No. But if you know, then you know how to react. You know the proper course of action. But if you react, oh, my God, they're coming to take over the world, including Casper, you react differently than you would, okay, they're scared. They're worried about Germany. How do we figure this out? How do we avoid another world war? And so... Oh, by the way, is this reaction then for both sides? Is this kind of a liberal foreign policy wise or a conservative foreign policy wise? Yeah, this is more conservative foreign policy. Yeah, it's it's, it's more isolationist because you're in your own little bubble looking at what they're doing without knowing it. Both sides. Remember what I told you: conservative foreign policy. Someone can be very conservative foreign policy wise and liberal economic policy. Especially back then, that was much more common than today. Today, it's far too. Wow. Moving on then. So, these are the fears. Everybody thought we we're going to be cramped, but everything began to blow up because of the issue of reparations. When the Soviets came in and occupied, they didn't get reparations. What did they do? You're not going to give us money? What did we do? They took it. In their occupation zone, they took everything of value. Literally everything. They stripped their occupation zone of everything they thought they might use. So they went through and took every piece of metal, nails, boards that weren't put intact, they took them. They went through houses, took rugs, carpets. The big thing they wanted were kitchen sinks and toilets. They really wanted those. They even cut up chunks of cement from the Autobahn, put it on trains, and took it back to the Soviet Union. They took everything. They stripped it. Now, East Germany is going to have this kind of weird thing where except in East Berlin, the Soviet occupation zone there, the rest of it is just going to be kind of like denuded. So if you go to places in East Berlin or East, what used to be East Germany, go to towns like uh, Magdeburg or Dresden, and they're, it's the ugliest place you've ever been. Because they just rebuilt them with all the cheapest stuff they could. So they took everything or it was blown up in the wall. These big, ugly cement buildings. So, no. what do you do with big chunks of cement? Stack them up. What was that? Why did you potentially need that? 
And the United States was mad too because here's Berlin in the occupation zone. There were three corridors that would allow for air, rail, and road transportation for the Allied occupation zones of Berlin. They would play games with them. The Russians would cut them off. They would take tolls. They'd check things. All these kind of games with Berlin, the occupation zone of Berlin. Now, I'm going to start calling the Allied occupation zone what I grew up with. It. That was simply going to be known as West Berlin. The British, French, and American occupation zones. The Russian occupation zones, East Berlin. And, yeah, it's still weird. And it's noticeable if you go there. Just east and west, it's just really noticeable, the difference. And so, because of Berlin and this issue of reparations, in 1946, Truman formally cut off Lindley's. He cut off Lindley's. He said, until we could come up with a compromise and an agreement on what to do about Germany, no Lindley's. To Stalin, that proved it. And you can argue that is the moment right here in 1946 that the Cold War officially begins, even though you can see it coming. But this is when people start to realize it. Yes, which Truman. Truman, yeah. Sorry. Reagan was a bad actor then. He did do the movie Bedtime for Bonzo. He was an okay actor, actually. We should watch it. No, we shouldn't. Make sure dad. Watch what? So, no. <laughs> All right, so the big thing, though, what hit the United States were two events, also in 1946, Iran. Now, actually, the West was still called Persia, but they wanted to be called Iran. Well, Persia, they saw it as an old archaic name. They want the new name. We are not, no longer going to be beholden to basically the British. We're Iran. Well, right here, this part of northern Iran, still or northern Persia, the Soviets occupied to get Lin Lise through there. The British occupied the southern part. After the war, the British left. The Soviets didn't leave. They're going to stay. And this became really controversial. Eventually, Stalin left. But the point is, there was a fear that Stalin was going to move into the Mideast. Now, why might the Mideast be an issue? The British got all their oil from the Mideast. West U.S. oil companies were also looking for a way, especially in the very poor, impoverished country of, you might have heard of it, Saudi Arabia. King Saud used to carry around the entire treasury for his country in a box on a necklace around his neck. They got more money now. A couple, couple more dollars. All right, Iran. Now, we'll come back to Iran. This is gonna be back in people's minds. Iran, the Soviets won it, the communists are coming there. But then, in 1947, Greece. Greece had been occupied by the Germans, brutally treated, because that's what the Germans did to every country they occupied. Greece. There's still a lot of resentment today in Greece over this. And now with the economic issue, they blame Germany. For good reason, in a way. But right here, Greece. After the war, Britain put in a dictatorship. Britain put in a military dictatorship. So everyone got that. Britain. Britain put in a military dictatorship. They put it in there because Britain saw this as their sphere of influence. The reason why is Greece is here in the Suez Canal is right here. And Britain saw that as kind of part of our realm. And Britain had been arming and supplying this military dictatorship in the country Greece was ravaged by war because there was a communist insurgency. The communists. Communists. Gorillas. 
And these communist guerrillas actually got their start fighting the Nazis in World War II. And when they weren't allowed to be in this government, the new government after the war, by the, the British wouldn't allow them in, they began a civil war. Now, Britain couldn't afford it. 1947, Britain finally had to accept the fact that they were completely broke. After World War I, then the Great Depression, then World War II, Britain's out of money. Your Britain's going to have to start giving up part of their empire. It's no coincidence that 1947 would be the same year that they pretty much just I mean, ran out of India. Goodbye, good luck. The next year they would do the same thing out of Palestine. Goodbye, good luck. And both lead to horrific civil wars. Because they just couldn't afford it anymore. And they would lose all their col almost all their colonies by 1960. They told the United States, we can't, we can't pay all. We don't have the money. What do you do? Truman understood something. And this is important for United States thought. After the war ended, what did a lot of Americans want our foreign policy to be? Just like after World War II. Isolations. The U.S. was really isolations. And very conservative. Conservative Democrats and Republicans. Pull back. If there's problems in Europe, we've done our part. And the U.S. began to demobilize its army and just pull back. But Truman understood something. He's not correct. The way he looked at it is, wait a second. Greece, a communist rebellion. If they win, there's an active communist party in war ravaged Italy. There's an active communist party in France. There's an active communist group in the occupied zones of Germany. They might revolt to and win. The economy of Western Europe is in shambles because of the war. That's a breeding ground for revolution. We're going to have to do something about this. But how does he convince isolationists to give money to armed Greece? Say it's Russia. Yeah. To say this isn't a little minor revolution. This is part of Soviet the Soviet plan to do what? Take over the world. And you the real thing was Europe, yeah, the world. This is all part of a plan. He scared him to death. He terrified him. He it, greatly exaggerated the threat from the Soviet Union. And that's what we got to get. Truman exaggerated the threat of the Soviet Union. Now, Truman did fear and hate Stalin. But if he knowingly exaggerated the threat of the Soviet Union, what did Truman do? Create a scapegoat. Hmm? Create a scapegoat. Yeah, create a scapegoat. Get the enemy. Created a boogeyman that everyone to fear. That monster under the bed. I'm actually using a, a, the terms they would use. And what else? If you knowingly mislead the public, what have you just done? Totalitarian. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a totalitarian thing. You're on the right track. Anything's justified in total war. He lied. And he justified because we have to stop the commies. Now, i got to be clear about something. He lied. He lied. This lying will set a precedent. Once you lie, it becomes easier to do what tomorrow? Lie again. And then do what? And keep secrets and lie again. It's a scary trend. And justification, we have to stop comments. And so what he did is, he gave a speech. And in this speech, it's his most influential speech. He was quite proud of it. He laid out the threat of these communist guerrillas being led by the Soviet Union in Greece and Turkey. With, oh, why Turkey? There was no communist revolution in Turkey. Russia had been trying to get this since Peter the Great. Mm -hmm. So they want to make sure that Turkey survives. And Greece, communist rebellion. Remember Iran? Iran's right here. Russia's right here. And so he said, there's a communist rebellion in Greece and Turkey. 
and they're going to overthrow what type of governments? No, democracies. Democracies. Freedom-loving democracies in Greece and Turkey are going to be overthrown by evil communists. Wait, what kind of government did Greece have? A really nasty military dictatorship. But what did he say? Freedom. These people are the moral equivalent in Greece of George Washington, Patrick Henry, John Adams. Boy, what an insult to Patrick Henry, George Washington. Do you have a bunch of cutthroats from a military junta in Greece? Junta means a military cabal. It's a great word. Use it at home. How dare you? Do it to your parents. You two are acting like a junta. <laughs> Trust me, it'll work. <laughs> or if you do it, say, some, who do you, if you do it, who do you say told you to say that? <laughs> Mr. McCar Mr. Carter works, Mr. Mahalish works, Mr. Larson works. Right? Any one of those three, or all three. Yeah. It's perfect for you. My evil uncle. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't call him a junta. Call him a troika. No, move it after. It worked. They voted $450 million to fight communism. And this is key now. What it did is it, too, set the precedent now that the United States will fight communism. But not fight for what? The United States is going to abandon democracy for any communism. This will lead to bad, bad things in the future. Very similar to what happened with basic diplomacy in Latin America, where there's going to be a lot of resentment against the United States because of basic diplomacy. It's going to happen here. The U.S. is going to support some horrific dictatorships because they're not communists. And this is going to happen all over, especially in the Mideast. Especially there. Guys, like, have, you, have you ever heard of Daniel Saddam Hussein? Uh, he's a CIA Yes. Uh, so this is, this is something I don't want to care. Very much so. And supporting really nasty dictatorships. Uzbekistan, the dictator there who boiled his enemies in oil. We gave him weapons. Yes. Um, so, choice. I know when Truman scared everyone into thinking that it was a Soviet mm -hmm. bomb, or was he just afraid of communism apparently, or was he afraid that they'd ally with the Soviet? You know, he was afraid of the Soviets. He didn't trust all. And there were things to fear, but he also knowingly exaggerated. He but knew he had to make people scared to get this passed. So, did he think that the communists in Greece were actually at all Soviet back? Yes, he did believe that. He believed they were being aided by Stalin. You want a funny story? Yeah. Stalin hated him. <laughs> Stalin did not support the Greek revolutionaries. He did everything to keep, to keep from aiding them. He did everything to stop the independent communist government in Yugoslavia from helping them. He also didn't help the communists in China. He didn't help the communists in Iran. He didn't like them. More like uh, in, the, in the same one, but they were independent. He wanted more control. And in this speech, Truman laid out the basis. Truman laid out the basis of American foreign policy till eh, about six minutes to twelve, April sixteenth. Yeah, still the basis of American foreign policy. It's called the Truman Doctrine. Now it's not like a law, but he laid out the reason why we have to stop the communists in Greece. And he based it a lot on George Keenan. George Keenan would write, and he was a uh, State Department official, an anonymous article in Foreign Path Policy Magazine under the pseudonym Mr. X. <laughs> Where Keenan said, the threat of communism is real. And therefore, we must adopt, and the Truman Doctrine would do this, containment. 
contain communism. And that's why we have to go to Greece, to contain communism. Surround it. Stop it from advancing. But why? There are five big reasons why. Let's do these really quick. Number one, communism is indivisible. What does indivisible mean? Can't divide. So every communist is the same. One communist, a communist in this classroom, who's the communist? I'm looking for you. Yeah, yeah, two right in front. And there here is more red. So you the communist blood. A communist in this classroom is the same as a communist in French Indochina, the same as a communist in the Congo, the same as Joseph Stalin. One communist is the same wherever they are. But unlike old wars, it's not just indivisible, they are ideological. It's not a nationality. It's something that literally bored its way into people's skulls and changed them. Oh, they look like everybody else. They talk like everybody else. But they're different. It's no coincidence that there is going to be this new genre of science fiction horror movies, late 40s, all through the 50s, and onward, where there's going to be a lot of like alien invasion and all these things. All of them are Cold War. And the aliens represent this unknown, the communist unknown. They look like you, they sound like you. That's where it comes from. That is the classic Cold War movie. Number two. <laughs> Why is it a threat? The domino theory. Actually, what Keenan said it was the domino effect, but by the 60s, everyone's going to say the domino theory. And the idea is this. If there's a communist rebellion in Greece, and they topple the communism, that will knock down their neighbor, Italy. Knock down their neighbor, France. Knock down their neighbor, Britain. And then who's next? Wyoming. Wyoming. <laughs> so, you have to stop in Greece. Because that, in reality, is an attack on the United States. And that means, number three, the attack could be anywhere, any and everywhere. I know that sounds like the same thing, but it's not. The war could be anywhere around the world, but it's also right here. Because there's underground members of communists working their way. And what does a communist look like? And it's going to be this wave. You can ask Mr. Sims about it. A wave of loyalty oaths, where everybody had to go give loyalty oaths. There's loyalty oath mania. Unions forced their members to give loyalty oaths. Teachers would have to do it. Students would have to do it. I, I, I'm a loyal American. By the way, if you're a communist spy, what's the first thing you would do if someone said do a loyalty oath? Okay. Oh, I pledge. What else did they do this way? Why did the when did the pledge of allegiance become mandatory in classrooms? Cold War. What did they add to prove we're not godless commies in 1951 because of this? Under God. I'm not a godless commie. So when the Founding Fathers said the Pledge of Allegiance, they didn't. It wasn't written. Last thing, number four. Last one for today. You would not believe how happy these students are. And even though they don't have to take the bigger, faster, stronger, smarter balance steps, <laughs> I'm going to give them the uh, I'm so happy about it. I'm not When I was a youth, it was an achievement test. And they meant about as much as anything else. Last thing, write down this. That means everything is so simple now. It's a bipolar world. It's bipolar. What does bipolar mean? Absolutely. Two sides. Who are the two sides? Us and them. Free and slave. Good and evil. Red and blue. Us and them. Isn't the world simple now? Oh, by the way, remember I said it's foreign policy today? If we take out one word and add another one, what is the other word you add? If you take out communism, add one other word, you have our foreign policy today. 
Terrorism. You have terrorism, and that's what we do today. Heck, we're bombing Yemen, because they're going to attack any day now. Yemenese gorillas will be hitting the shores of Wyoming. You count on it. The shores of Wyoming. <laughs> The thing is, is, is it's different kind of slightly different than the short IDs, and so they're still not 100% used to them. And so I, I'm letting them do it again. So much that stupid test. I mean, the good parts of the test, but so much is not how to do it. You know what I mean? Know the tricks. Communism is indivisible and ideological. We'll come back to the Chinese. <laughs> 